Good evening, everyone. Welcome again to the Sharia Crime Stoppers weekly Tuesday night productions of the webinars that we think will inform you and bring you to action. And that's our goal, and we're committed to do these every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. time. Uh, and bring you, we're very fortunate to be able to bring you outstanding guests. For example, tonight we have with us Philip Haney. Uh, Phil, Philip's topic is going to be the terrorist ties that bind. And he's going to discuss the links between the Sri, Sri Lanka bomb bombings, the Muslim Brotherhood, the Deoband movement, and Islamic State. Before we bring Philip on to say hi and give us some background, let me just mention that we do keep track of the Ramadan Bombathon. Unfortunately, every year, the religion of peace keeps track of the number of attacks and the, unfortunately the number of dead people uh, that occur during the heightened activity that, that unfortunately corresponds to the Sharia month of Ramadan. So far in nine days, uh, we are aware of 52 attacks around the world. Uh, we are aware of 254 people that are dead and many, many people injured. So the terrorist ties that bond are extremely consequential. It happens every day and it continues to happen. And so we'd like to learn more and more about uh, the networks, how they work, and there's nobody better at that than our friend Philip Haney. I think you know that Philip Haney is the author of See Something, Say Nothing, which is a, a, a incredible uh, collection of revelations that uh, tell the story of his experience as a DHS whistleblower, his experience doing his job, his experience, having his job impacted uh, by the, the deep state um, and the leadership in the administration that he was working in at the time. So Phil will fill you in on all of that. But tonight we're going to listen to Phil telling us about the terrorist ties that bind. Give us very, very timely information about um, really the, the crime we're talking, we're talking about tonight are mass, mur mass murders all over the world. So Philip Haney, Good evening, Phil. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Okay, well, just take us through, and we'll, uh, by the way, we want to remind people very fact based, and he's got every, every says is backed up by fact. So if you have questions, remember there's a button at the bottom of your page, of your screen. You click on that uh, QA button, you, you type in your. Mary is a co founder of the Sharia Crime Stoppers, is with us tonight as. Every, every week, and she will be hosting uh, the section that we'll have at the end where we'll go through your questions. So with that, we'll turn it over to Philip. All right, Dick. You know, I wanted to uh, comment on what you said about the number of attacks that have occurred in the first nine days of Ramadan. You said uh, about 52. Well, that's about six per day. And there's a point. I'm, you're, it's going to be amazing when I get to the point here. And that's about one every four hours. But what's incredible that since 9-11, there have been about 34,700 attacks. And that is exactly the number per hour. Four, one attack every four hours since 9-11, which is exactly the number that has happened here during this time of Ramadan. So in other words, it's usual. This thing has been going on now for 18 years straight. So now we're going to switch. We're going to talk about a couple other attacks that have happened that a lot of us have heard about. And I'm going to make some connections between Sri Lanka and the San Bernardino attacks. So I'm going to go right ahead. And we'll start with San Bernardino, which happened on the 2nd of December, 2015. We've all seen this picture before. This is uh, Syed Farouk right here and his wife, Tashfin Malik. You can tell by the way he's dressed with what he's wearing and the way his beard is that he's a member of, of a Deobandi group. In this particular case, he's a member of uh, Tablighi Jamaat. Now, the reason why I know this when I was active duty Working with the Department of Homeland Security, I tracked the group called Tablighi Jamaat. They're known as the Army of Darkness. They're somewhere between 75 and 125 million members of Tablighi Jamaat in the whole world. 
And when I was working active duty at the Port of Atlanta and or at the Intelligence Center in Washington, D.C., I tracked individuals that were part of this group. And the way they came to my attention initially is they would come in groups of three, four, or five in, at a time. And each one of them have a letter signed by an imam of a mosque here in the United States, a visitation letter. We're coming in on the visa waiver program, which means they didn't have to have a visa if they're from particular countries in the EU, for example, from the UK. But I found out that they also had another passport, often from either Pakistan, Bangladesh, or India. And so on the one hand, they were traveling in that part of the world on a, on a one passport, and they were coming here to America on another passport. That's obviously a wide open hole for fraud. Plus, they were going to mosques in parts of the country where we already had a connection and nexus for terrorism. And so that started the case that eventually became known as the Madrasa Boy case. Now you're going to hear that term again as we go forward, Madrasa. And that is a school where young boys, mostly young boys, go usually four or five, sixth grade, and they start memorizing the Quran. And if they go through all the entire program and memorize the Quran, they're called a Hafiz. And this person, Syed Farouk, was a very well-known individual at the Dar al al-Islamiya Mosque in San Bernardino. And he also was part of a broader network in what is called here in California the Inland Empire, going all the way from San Bernardino Riverside out to Sac uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Diego. The whole southern California is called the Inland Empire. And he had connections all over that. He wasn't just an obscure, marginal person that no one knew. He was quite well known. And he was sent by the mosque to marry Tashfin Malik in Saudi Arabia during Ramadan. They got married. Her father was from Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, but he was doing business in Saudi Arabia. He met there and were married, came here, and eventually ended up killing. 14 people in San Bernardino. So that's Tablighi Jamaat. And then a week later, I went on Megyn Kelly and I told her and I told the American people in con contradicting the Obama administration that he wasn't just some random lone wolf with no connections to any social structure or Islamic group, that he was actually part of Tablighi Jamaat. I said it right out during the show. And the person on the right here, Mark Thiessen, after I talked, he talked and backed me up. Well, it turns out that a week later, on December 17, 2015, the FBI did something that I'd never seen them do before. They released an unredacted transcript of their interview with Enrique Marquez. See, Enrique Marquez. He's the person that supplied the guns in some way to Syed Farouk and Tashfin Malik. See, one of the things he was tried with, conspiring to provide material support to terrorists, making a false statement in connection to the acquisition of firearms, fraud and misuse of visas, permits, and other documents. Remember I told you about possible fraud with Tablighi Jumat people? Well, there's this charge right here. And so the point is, is that this case that I worked on, that they gave me credit for finding 300 terrorists when I worked at the National Targeting Center on just this case alone, had been shut down in around July to August of 2012. So three and a half years later is when the San Bernardino shootings occurred. And you're gonna see as we go forward that a very similar thing happened with Sri Lanka. Intelligence provided the authorities in Sri Lanka the information that they needed 
could have used to stop the attack, but they chose to ignore it. So with exactly the same group, a large Deo Bandi group, one in America and one in Sri Lanka, conducting a terrorist operation that very plausibly could have been shut down. One happened here on the 2nd of December 2010, and another one happened in Sri Lanka on April 21st, 2019. And uh, the connection with the deep state, if you will, is that the individuals in either elected positions or appointed, like for example, Janet Napolitano and or Hillary Clinton with the State Department, shut the case down. And as we go along, you're going to see how that really was and the level of arrogance and criminality that's involved because these decisions are not just simple political decisions, they affected people's lives. Not only were people killed in the terrorist attacks, but it also affected the lives of law enforcement officers like myself. It, it uh, significantly damaged our, my career. It had an effect on my family, my own wife, and my story is similar to everyone who stood up against the Obama administration and just simply tried to do their job to uphold the oath of office. So the point of this is that a week after I went on Megyn Kelly, we can go back to that. I talked to Megyn Kelly on the 10th of December and a week later, the FBI released the unredacted transcript showing that Enrique Marquez led to Islam by Syed Farouk and that he was part of Tablighi Jamaat. I have never seen before or since the FBI releasing an unredacted transcript of any case. And so it still amazes me to this day that this happened. But it proved that what I had said on Megyn Kelly was right. Imagine if I had said that Syed Farouk was part of a group like, let's just say Hamas or Hezbollah or Lash Kataiba, any number, any of a hundred other groups. He still would have been a terrorist, but I would have been wrong on a technicality. And you can be sure that DHS would have notified Fox News and made darn sure that they let Fox News, News know that I was unreliable and I didn't know what I was talking about. Because that's exactly what they tried to do to me by investigating me nine times, was to show that I was reckless discriminatory, biased, and unreliable. But as it turned out, I was right. A little while later, I wrote an editorial on the Hill talking about the fact that DHS had ordered me to scrub the records of Muslims with terror ties. Excuse me. <coughs> this Tablighi Jamaat case was not the first time that that had happened. The first time that it happened was clear back in 2009 when the Obama administration ordered me to delete the information out of more than 820 classified records that had particular to do with the Muslim Brotherhood Network, which just so happens to be the other large group that I worked on during the course of my career was Muslim Brotherhood. And I'm talking about the groups that we've all heard of a hundred times. Council on American Islamic Relations, Islamic Society of North America, Muslim Public Affairs Council, North American Islamic Trust, Assembly of Muslim Jurists of America, and a big long list of names, and the individuals that were affiliated with these organizations. Well, I'd spent my entire career from clear back in 2003 on through 2006, through 08 until Barack Hussein Obama was elected, and he decided that he had a better way to uh, do counterterrorism. It was not based on law enforcement. It was going to be based on making sure that the civil rights and civil liberties of and the privacy rights of foreign nationals would be protected first and foremost, and that, therefore, they would respect us and they wouldn't uh, conduct terrorist attacks against us. I guess that was the reasoning. 
And so people like myself that were basic counterterrorism and law enforcement and, and connecting the dots, now suddenly we're in the crosshairs. So if the first thing they tried, they did was they ignored the information, but that didn't always work because our information was actually correct. So the next thing they went to is they took the records out of the system. Either they ordered people like me to do it, or they went in themselves in violation of uh, security standards, took my own, so, my own social security, which is my unique ID, and would delete the records on their own. But they forgot that there's an option in these records that allows you to see if somebody has come and looked at it and it sends an email to your inbox so every time that they deleted these records i would get an email so i have absolute proof that they were del deleted i know the second down to the minute and the second and the person who deleted them so why am i telling you all this is because this corruption that we're seeing has broken out into the open with this ongoing investigation of President Trump by people in the State Department and in the DOJ, in the FBI, and so on, has been going on for a long time. Not only has it been going on for a long time, but it was literally the same people. I'm talking about Mueller in the FBI. Brandon is National Security Advisor to President Obama in the White House, Napolitano, Jay Johnson, Eric Holder in the Department of State, and that's the highest level corruption that you can get. They put our entire country at risk, and people died because of the policies that they implemented, like, for example, actually literally deleting uh, classified information out of the database. So yes, I have proof of it. We're going all the way back to the year 2012 now, and this is 2019. So I've been talking about this for seven years, and I've been writing, and I've, I published a book about it, and I, I've, I've been as clear and precise and accurate as I possibly could. And now, sadly, something else has happened that's proven my case, proven that what I said was true. And I'm not glad that it happened to prove my case. I'm very sad, but it was Sri Lanka because it was the same group over on the other side of the world that, that conducted the Sri Lanka bombings as conducted the shootings in San Bernardino. And so it's easy to imagine I'm sure you're, what you're thinking right now is that if I had simply been allowed in myself and other people like me to continue working on these networks all these years, then it's very plausible, isn't it, that we would have been able to help prevent those networks. It's obvious with Sri Lanka, they came right out and said it, that they had the information, they had the people that were involved, the name of the group, and almost the time that they intended to do it, and they chose to ignore the information. Well, in as a lot of those, a lot of the same thing happened with the attack in San Bernardino. And that's my point. I'm trying to make a connection here between things that happened years ago that are still relevant today. And I'm hoping that we will get a remedy. And we'll continue on and I'll, I'll explain how I hope that will happen. Bye. Between Sri Lanka and San Bernardino, there was another t attack in England where several people connected, as it says right here, Tablighi Jamaat, the secretive ultra-Orthodox Islamic sect behind many controversial mega-mosque proposals and linked to the 7-7 tourists. And right here it says, this is dated June 13, 2017, the San Bernardino shooter. This particular person stabbed eight people to death on the bridge in London. And this, this he was part of Tablighi Jamaat. And another little known fact is that 25% of all the people in Gitmo, there are, by the way, still people in Gitmo, were Tablighi Jamaat. 
But that's not all. No, nope, that's not all. There's going to be more as I move forward. You will see how important this relatively or virtually unknown group, how, and that they shouldn't be unknown. They should be very well known by now, 18 years after 9-11. So then we go into the U.S. Senate hearings with Chairman Ted Cruz, who called the willful blindness. This was the 28th of June, 2016. We're coming up on not quite three years now. And this time in the history of Congress that subject matter experts testified and told about the threat of the emerging threat of the global Islamic movement and their overarching goal, which is to implement Sharia law everywhere in the world, including here in the United States. This was the 28th of September. I mean June, excuse me, 2016. The willful blindness. Consequences of agency efforts to de-emphasize radical Islam in combating terrorism. Well, that's kind of a fancy way. <coughs> I'm sorry. Agency efforts is another way of talking about the deep state. We didn't even call it back deep state as early as or as recently as 2016 but this was Ted Cruz's way of describing what was emerging what would soon be known as the deep state because remember this is just a couple months before the elections when President Trump was elected in November of 2016 and I think they already were beginning to sense I when I say they I mean the people like Mueller and Brennan and Clapper and Holder and Clinton, Napolitano, Johnson, the whole group, that Trump might win. Of course, if he wins, they realize that they're going to suddenly be at very high risk because, believe me, they knew that what they were doing was unconstitutional, but they didn't care. They had an agenda, they have a worldview, and they were bound and determined that they were going to implement that those policies decisions no matter what the Constitution said and no matter what immigration laws were already in place and no matter what level of risk they put our country to it's obvious that they didn't care about national security otherwise they would have never made the decisions and implemented the policies or done things like delete entire archives of classified information out of the law enforcement database which then put us at great risk and people died because of it. So here's a picture of uh, those of us who testified at this hearing on the 28th of June. That's Zudi Jaster. This is Farhan Akira. She's the one that was responsible for the letter that went to Brennan, the National Security Advisor for Obama, back in 2011 that led to what is known as the Great Purge. There, This is myself here and this is Richard Cohen we've heard of Richard Cohen quite a bit haven't we because he was recently discredited he was in the poverty law center and then here's Chris Galbetz right here and this is an FBI officer I have to say I forgot and then this is McCarthy Andy McCarthy so these are the people that testified at this event and here I am put, holding up a picture of uh, the icon of the top league, Jamaat. I talked about this group extensively during the, my testimony before the Congress, Senate, before the Judiciary Committee with Chairman Ted Cruz. And I'll tell you what, if you want to see something pretty funny, even though there's not really very much about this story that's funny, but if you want to see something amazing, Go back and watch Richard Cohen's face, facial expressions, while I'm talking during my testimony. It's the most amazing display of agitation and irritation. He can hardly sit still. And the looks and the expressions that he gives me are astonishing. Of course, I didn't realize he was watching me while I was talking. I'm looking straight ahead at the panel, particularly Senator Cruz. I go back and look at the tape later on, or the, the uh, you know C-SPAN. I couldn't believe it. 
it's really quite an infantile display. It's like he's having a temper tantrum. So here is what Ted Cruz said about the testimony that I gave. He said, I commend both members of the media and the American public to examine your testimony closely because you have described a systemic or systematic policy indeed of scrubbing by erasing references to radical Islam. And then I talked down here, it talks about how they did it because of civil rights and civil liberties and privacy rights and that it led to Orlando and San Bernardino. I laid it all out on the table, very plainly. It's part of history, friends. Now, where do you suppose I would be today if I had been wrong? I would have been discredited, wouldn't I? I would have just been another person like the steel dossier, some, some uh, discredited supposed intelligence officer that when it was all said and done, didn't know what I was talking about. But I was right. I talked specifically about the name of this group. Tablighi Jamaat and the Deobandi network, the larger branch of Islam that they were part of, and that there was a threat to America, and that if we didn't address it, that it was inevitable that we would have more terrorist attacks in the future. And I didn't just mean in the United States. And sadly, I was right. So what I would like to see, of course, is a remedy. And I am more hopeful now and I've been since at least 2006, which is a long time to wait, that uh, President Trump may actually have the, the uh, pieces in place like a transmission, because that's what it's like. You have Department of Justice, you have Treasury, you have Secretary of Department of State, you have DHS, you have FBI, and then you have the executive branch of the government that all have to mesh together like gears in the transmission in order for this designation proposal, meaning the designation in this case of the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization, in order for it to actually be successful and transmit the power of the executive order or the, 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 uh, the order from President Trump to designate the group all the way through the system. So I read the federal government shut the case down. So we'll go on. Here's Richard Cohen, his testimony. And then in his written notes that he provided, his written testimony, you see right there that he was part of the Countering Violent Extremism Working Group. Well, this is a person that never believed in a law enforcement-based approach to counterterrorism from the very beginning. And he had been on the Countering Violent Extremism Working Group Steering Committee since the year 2010. So for six years, people like him who were placed on the committee by Janet Napolitano originally, along with known members, half of the members of this committee were members of the Muslim Brotherhood. It's hard to believe it, isn't it? But history will show when we actually move far away enough from this period of history and people actually sit down and write books about what happened during this era, they're going to, they're just going to, they're not going to hardly be able to believe that this really happened in America. That the actual Secretary of Homeland Security put members of the Muslim Brotherhood and or members of the civilian community to the steering committee that decided the policies about how we were going to protect our national security, i.e. the countering violent extremism working group, and move farther and farther away from the law enforcement based approach to counterterrorism and went more into the political approach. And now we're finally starting to reverse that but it's really quite an amazing paradox to be sitting, literally. On my left was Richard Cohen, and on my 
excuse me, yeah, and on my right was Farhan Akira. Farhan Akira was responsible for the Great Purge of 2011 and 12, and Richard Cohen was responsible for dismantling a law enforcement approach uh, basis for counterterrorism. So I was sitting between two of my most implacable civilian enemies, which did as much damage to the country as any terrorist could do, because they undermined the Constitution, and they forced law enforcement officers to violate their oath of office unless they were courageous enough to stand up. Uh, there's only one book that is still to this day been written from the Department of Homeland Security. One. That's see something, say nothing. I saw Victoria Tonsing and Joe DeGeneva on the Fox the other night, or I should say I read their interview. And one of the things that they remarked about this whole long fiasco with the investigation of President Trump by Mueller and Brennan and Clapper and so on, is that not one single person, they were talking specifically about the FBI, not one single person came forward as a whistleblower. In all the levels and hierarchy within the FBI, not even one person came forward to say, hey, wait a minute, this isn't right. I don't exactly know what the right approach is to go forward to let somebody know that this isn't right, but I'm going to make an effort. And that's what I did, friends. I never violated this chain of command. I wasn't a, a uh, Chelsea Manning, a Bradley Manning, a Wilbur, an Edward Snowden who went outside the chain of command. Because of that, I had to wait a lot longer to see any remedy. But because I never went out of the chain of command, I survived the process, barely, not without lack of trying on their part, because I was investigated nine times by the very same people that were after Trump, have been after Trump. And I mean that literally. Any of those that are listening and have my book, go to look in the index in the back, and you will see them. Mueller's there, Brennan's there, Clapper's in there, the FBI, the DHS, Napolitano, Whole, the whole crew is in the index of the book. So why do I bring that up? It's because it shows that I was right, that what I said was really true, and that I talked about these people before they became so well known, before they broke into the national, what I call the national media big screen. And now we hear about them all the time. But I'm hoping, and it looks like we're going in that direction, that uh, Attorney General Barr is going to Burr, excuse me, Barr is going to go back and look and find and dig into what the real basis of these investigations was. And eventually, I hope to join Rain in that effort and get to the bottom of why these records were deleted out of the law enforcement database. And here, by the way is Jay Johnson. Isn't that a spectacular display of arrogance and hubris? This is the Secretary of Homeland Security, and he didn't just sit like that for five seconds. This isn't just a, a picture that caught him off guard, you know, the unflattering picture. That was his body language on the 30th of June when Senator Cruz asked him to come back, and Senator Cruz point blank asked him, about my claims of records being deleted from the system and whether or not he had taken the time to look into what I said and what was a concern. He said, no, I haven't taken the time to look into Mr. Haney's claims and no, I'm not concerned about it. He said, it's all a matter of semantics and labeling. This is the Secretary of Homeland Security. And he even said that he had no knowledge of the incident, meaning the deletion incident, and that he'd never even heard of me. Well, guess what, friends? That was a flat-out lie. He had talked at the Muslim Students Association in Detroit, Michigan, in January of 2016, and somebody in the, act, in the audience amazingly asked him specifically if he had seen that article in The Hill that I showed you earlier 
about the deletion of the records. And he said to them, it's on the record, that he knew about the article and he knew about me. And this is one of the problems that appointed officials seem to think they're immune from accountability. And you could tell by his body language, he had no intention whatsoever of answering Senator Cruz's questions. It was really what I call obscene hubris. It was a spectacular display of arrogance. Can you imagine working for somebody like this? Who's your actual boss? I don't have to imagine. I, I know exactly what it was like. I'm astonished myself, to be honest, that I actually survived the whole thing and didn't end up in jail or, you know, something else bad. Now we're going to shift to Sri Lanka, April 21st, 2019. If you go back and you look at the pictures of the walls of the churches that were bombed really carefully, you will see hundreds and hundreds of these uniform sized little holes all over the walls. You know what those are? Those are ball bearings. They would they pack their backpacks with high explosives and ball bearings. And a few after the actual day of the attacks, which is the 21st of April, they actually found uh, the leader's house, safe house, with his two of his brothers and his father. And they approached it and they ended up in this tremendous firefight. Fifteen members of Hashim's family, the leader of this group, Tawi Jamaat, that did the bombings, died in the attack. Not one law enforcement officer or military personnel was hurt badly in the attack. But when all the smoke had settled, the dust had settled, they found a stash or a cache of 100,000 ball bearings there in that house that they were intending to use for other bombs. So the Sri Lankan officials, remember I said earlier, ignored the intelligence agencies who had tips about bombing the bombing. That's, as I mentioned, that's exactly what happened here in America. And to this day, the FBI, the DOJ, the Department of State, the DHS, none of the agencies, law enforcement agencies involved that were responsible for protecting our national security, not one of them has taken had taken any responsibility for what happened in San Bernardino. In fact, for three years now, I've been involved in a class action lawsuit to try to help the families from San Bernardino who were affected by the attack. And just this month, our case was for the nth time thrown out of court. And now, yes, we're going to appeal and we're going to try to go to the next step. But they have, they use a provision that I'd never heard of before. Maybe you have. It's called sovereign immunity. And in the paperwork of our case, they say that even though it's obvious that the, the people were harmed and that the government was negligent, they're still protected by this provision called sovereign immunity, which is very ominous in my opinion. And it doesn't sound constitutional. And I really do believe if I had the opportunity to sit down with President Trump and I give my best ever presentation that within a half an hour or less, maybe a little more, I think President Trump would be so mad about this that he would really take action. He would actually, he would do something about it. And I still hope that that day will come. I believe that if he really knew the basic facts and how outrageous this whole story is that he would set in motion uh, the events that would lead to finally getting some remedy and the families of the people in San Bernardino and or in Orlando because it's related to San Bernardino it's part of the same network yes I said it's part of the same network this network this very same network over in Sri Lanka and even the Boston Marathon bombing, which isn't exactly related to the same network, but there was a grotesque amount of negligence involved in that case as well. And yes, I have proof of that too. So you're talking about macro level Muslim Brotherhood affiliated organizations. 
And on this side of the equation, with Sri Lanka and San Bernardino and Orlando, you're talking about this global level group. And I'm going to show you how amazingly woven together they actually are. And so the first thing that starts to come out, just like Dick Manassari said earlier, I believe, that the first thing they start doing is talking about what it isn't. Or they try to give the impression that the Tawhid Jamaat, this group out of Sri Lanka, that nobody had ever heard of them before. Well, that's not true at all. The, the Tawhid Jamaat is as well known as Tabligi Jamaat. And the Tawhid Jamaat, which means National Unity Party. It's the same name, Tabligi Jamaat in San Bernardino, Tawhid Jamaat in Sri Lanka. The word Jamaat is the same word. It means group or organization. This is the unity group. The Tabligi Jamaat means the group of, of promoters of Islam are all part of the Deobandi branch of Islam. And so it's just exactly the opposite. If they didn't know about them, that's their, that's their job. They're supposed to know. And now you can get a perspective on why it was so damaging, so dangerous, so criminal for the Obama administration to delete all that information out of the system. Because how in the world are we supposed to ever get to know who groups like this are if the administration is running around behind law enforcement officers deleting the information as fast as they can possibly put it in. And I just pointed this out to say that some of the people that were in the eight individuals who pulled the trigger on the bombings, trained in places as diverse as Turkey, as in India, and Bangladesh over here. See, it's international, friends. It isn't just some local little tiny group. Any more than it was Syed Farouk and his wife Tashvi Malik were some unknown couple that nobody ever heard about before. It was just the opposite. Syed Farouk was a very well-placed individual with connections all over the Inland Empire. This is the person that was the leader of the Tawhid Jamaat. His name is... Uh, Mohammed Zaran. In the media, on Facebook and such, his name was Zaran Hashim. Amazingly, now you cannot see any of his videos. So you can't learn anything about what he said because, in the process of trying to keep supposedly being radicalized on the internet and by the YouTube, they destroy all the evidence or they take it out of the public domain so that people could actually go back and carefully study what he actually said. Yes, I know it's a double-edged sword to leave this information out there. Truth is more powerful than the darkness, don't you? And that we should have the ability to go back and analyze what he said. Instead of leaving it to a small handful of possible experts that may or may ever actually get around to going back and analyzing what he said. I find that counterproductive at best in terms of law enforcement. We should be able to review what he said and learn from it. This is uh, the declaration from ISIS, Islamic State, and they pledged Baya. Baya means to pledge your loyalty to uh, al-Baghdadi, the Sheikh of uh, Islamic State. But at the same time, they're also connected to a much larger macro coalition called Al-Qaeda of the Indian subcontinent, which is the largest Salafi Jihad coalition in the history of the world because it has Jihad groups from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, from India, from Bangladesh, and from Myanmar. And that is the exact geographical center of the Deobandi movement that I keep bringing up over and over again. These guys, my friends, are Deobandis. So are the Taliban. So is Lashka Taiba. So is Tabliki Jamaat. And so is Tawhid Jamaat. So why is this so important? Well, I'm going to show you here. 
Eamon El Zawahiri started this organization that I keep talking about called AQIS in February of 2014. He said that the purpose of the AQIS was to wage jihad against its enemies, to liberate its land, to restore its sovereignty and re faith. That's exactly the same as every other jihad group that operates in the world. It just so happens that this is the biggest one that's ever existed. And I wanted to point out, now I'm going to, I'm going to come to kind of the conclusion of how this all fits together. Most people, when they think of Al-Qaeda, they think of Osama bin Laden and some Mujahideen fighters with AK-47s over in Afghanistan. But they don't maybe realize that the original Al-Qaeda, which wasn't actually even called Al-Qaeda, they never referred to it themselves as Al-Qaeda. They called it the World Islamic Front, or the Global Jihad Front. It was actually founded by five people, Osama bin Laden, Ahmed Taha, Mir Hamza, Fazl Rahman of the Jihad movement in Bangladesh, which is Deobandi, and Ayman al-Zawahiri, leader of the Egyptian Islamic Jihad. See, now you come full circle. Here he is up here, starting AQIS, the largest coalition that's ever existed. Going all the way back to his time with the Egyptian Islamic Jihad, which is a front group for the Muslim Brotherhood. It's the Egyptian version of Hamas. But here's the real core of it, friends. This, in addition to the five individuals who formed the original coalition we know of as Al-Qaeda, or the World Islamic Front, you have these 13 organizations, including the 055 Brigade. I'm gonna look at, show you the ones that are Deobandi in nature the Uyghur Jihad organization, the Harakat al-Mujahideen, the Sifa al-Sahaba, the Lashka al-Jangvi, Harakat al-Jihad al-Islami, and the one we've all heard of, the Taliban. That is seven, friends. Seven of the 13 members of the original group we know of as Al-Qaeda today were Deobandis. And yet I think it's safe to say that in all the years that we've been hearing about Al-Qaeda and Yusam bin Laden and that Al-Qaeda is on the run and that ISIS has been destroyed in Syria and in Iraq, that we've never been told so very plainly that half of the entire structure of what we know of as Al-Qaeda is part of the Deobandi branch of Islam. It's like a kabuki play. That's a Japanese play with life-size puppets, and they're operated by people who are dressed entirely in black, like a ninja. And they operate the puppet, and they're there, but you don't see them. Don't you find it astonishing? In all the years that we've been talking about Al-Qaeda and Ayman al-Zawahiri and Yusam bin Laden and all, all of the, the conflicts and wars that we've been fighting in the Middle East and in Afghanistan and so on, that we virtually never heard about the other organizations that are Deobandi in nature. And now do you see why it was so fundamentally destructive for the Obama administration to come after officers like me who are doing our best to connect the dots together and show that not only was it the Arab speaking Muslim Brotherhood based organizations, but it was also the Pashtun Urdu based Indian subcontinent organizations that form this coalition. And while we've been squeezing the balloon on the Arabic speaking side, like in Syria and Iraq, all that air has been pushed out into the Deobandi branch of, of the coalition into the Indian subcontinent. And so it's obvious, I think already you're thinking that uh, this is going to lead to some more attacks and you're right. And I'll show you. On May 1st, I published this article with my friend and co-writer, Jim Phelps, in the journal. It's called Defense and Strategy Alert. It's a journal out of India. And it's the only journal in India that's authorized to speak on behalf 
and write articles about the military in India. And we published this article called Madrasas in Grain Worldwide. Gateway had 20,000 madrasas. This article was already approved in draft and ready to be published when the Sri Lanka bombings happened, which means that it's prophetic because we talked about the network of madrasas. And now subsequent, it also ties back into the Madrasa Boy case that I referred to earlier. When I saw kids just like this from here in America that looked just like this when I first met them. But over a four and five and six year period, as they would come back home to America to celebrate Ramadan, which we're in right now, I watched them transform from boys into men with beards and they became Salafi Imams as they went to this program in South Africa called the Nalim program. It's part of the Madrasa network. Yeah, there might be 20 or 30,000 Madrasas just in Pakistan alone, but there's another 10 or 15 or 20,000 of them in India and multiple thousands of them in Bangladesh and in Afghanistan and, and in Myanmar and all over the world, including here in the United States. And what's remarkable is that since this article was published and the Sri Lankan bombings happened, writers and observers and analysts around the world are starting to realize that the real focus, the real nexus of this whole uh, global gravitational force in the global Islamic movement is coming out of the madrasas. And here, by the way, is a, is a picture that illustrates the connections between the Deobandi branch and the Arabic-speaking branch, what we call Al-Qaeda or the Global Islamic Movement. This is a very well-known individual who is an eminent leader of the Deobandi movement. And this is Yusuf al-Qaradawi, who is the sheikh, of, the sheikh of the Muslim Brotherhood. And so that's one more connection. Now, I'm not going to talk about it as much in this presentation today, but I do want you to understand that this global Islamic movement has ties to the Muslim Brotherhood. And the point there is, Mr. President, you have even more reasons now to designate the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization, along with the Islamic State under al-Baghdadi and closely affiliated with that, Al-Qaeda of the Indian subcontinent, and then you have the Deobandi movement that I keep talking about. They're all blended together like this into a macro organization. And here's some of the background information on the Deobandi connections, which I showed you a little bit earlier. Jaish Muhammad Jamiat Ulima, Jamiat Ulima Islam, Tabligi Jamaat, and the Taliban. Once again, they're all part of this macro global coalition, which goes all the way from Sri Lanka clear to San Bernardino. And in just in case you're wondering, the Tawheed Jamaat is right here in the United States. You can go right on Facebook and look at their page, which is, by the way, what I used to do when I was in intelligence. You want to know what they think, what they're talking about, just go right on their, their social media and look. And from among you, there should be a party who invite the good and enjoin that which is right and forbid that was wrong. And these it is that shall be successful. This is a really incredibly powerful verse because it has to do with awala wa albara, which means enjoining the good and forbidding the wrong. And that's why they are called Salafi, because they're going back to the basic practice of Islam as Muhammad. And whatever he did, they do. Whatever he forbid, they forbid. And they are called Salafi, which means going back to the original. And all the Tabliki Jamaat organizations are Salafi, pro-Sharia, pro-Jihad organizations. Now, here's what the governments are talking about doing now. All of a sudden, this is April 29th, they want to start looking at the madrasas. They're going to take control of a network of over 30,000 madrasas as part of a drive to mainstream the by bringing them under state control 
the military spokesman said on Monday. Well, there's a there's a blinking red, there's a waving red flag right there, military, not civilian. What do you suppose is going to happen when these jihadi fighters that are protecting these madrasas confronted by members of the military in their own country? Nothing good. And so that I take it from the theor theoretical and abstract, I'm going to show you exactly what they have said they're going to do in just a minute. Along with Pakistan, you have Sri Lanka. They have already expelled at least 200 Imams from their country following the Easter attacks along with 600 other foreign nationals back to countries like Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan. Well, how many of those do you suppose are Deobandis? Virtually all of them. They're going to be members of the same groups that I keep talking about. So this is a good thing. Sri Lanka wants to protect its national security. The earlier one is a good thing. Pakistan says it wants to uh, its national security. And here's another article along the same line talking about Pakistan Islamic school reforms aimed to curb extremism. They're admitting in a way that the extremism as a pure Salafi Islam is coming right out of the madrasas. So they're beginning to realize that the real core the center of gravity of this global Islamic movement are these boys that go from these young boys like this to these older men like that. And this boy may become an imam. This boy here might become a uh, specialist in Sharia law. But this boy over here and all the rest of them may very well find themselves on a battlefield somewhere. Because they're going to do one of the three things. They're either going to become an imam, they're going to become a scholar of Sharia, and it's called fiqh, or they're going to go onto the battlefield and fight a jihad somewhere. And meanwhile, it's not just in the Middle East. Europe is being confronted by the same problem. They're beginning to realize that these Islamic fundamentalist, meaning Salafi, schools are teaching the kids in the schools the basic principles of, of jihad and Salafi Islam. So you're going to see a lot of uh, stress and conflict in the months and years ahead as governments attempt to begin to rein in, if you will, or have oversight over these schools because they're going to, to get a lot of pushback. Here are just a few articles that have come out since the Sri Lankan bomb. Governments are like all of a sudden waking up that this, the real problem is coming out of the schools, which is exactly the nature of the case that I worked on again when I was active duty that I called the Madrasa boy case. So if I had, if I had not been uh, investigated and pushed out and forced to retire, I very likely would have still been working in the intelligence branch of DHS. Can you imagine how much information I could have gathered if I stayed working on it all the way back from 2011 and 12, clear up to now, without the government coming in and eradicating all this information? Well, here on April 29th, and then again on May 4th, and then May 6th, and another series of articles here, May 7th, May 9th, they're starting to post information about the realization that the real core of this is coming out of the schools. This is where the heart of it is. Now we have this thing here that I'm about to conclude. This is called the Code of Conduct. It's a 20-page document that was written in English because they want the English-speaking the West to understand exactly what they intend, which is very, very similar to a document that we've all heard of a lot called the Explanatory Memorandum. See, this is the general strategic goal for the group in North America. This means the group of the Muslim Brotherhood in North America, what their goals and what their, their tactics will be. And here's exactly the same thing, because code of conduct is a synonym for Sharia-compliant tactics. 
called From the AQIS, the Al-Qaeda of the Indian Subcontinent, that was published in June 2014. So here you have 87, between 87 and 91, this one was published. So what is that, 25 years later? The AQIS publishes a very, very similar kind of document, and it would certainly do intelligence officers and national security experts and people concerned with sovereignty to study and take to heart what it says in the Code of Conduct. For example, in Section 13, they tell you plainly that they consider themselves to be the protectors and guardians of the ulama. This word ulama means the scholars and the madari. That's the Pashtun Urdu word for the same as madrasa. And they tell you very plainly that they consider themselves the jama, the coalition, that they will pass the whole journey of jihad providing guidance and supervision for the ulama, and that, that the jama will become a strong force for scholars and madaris and provide the ability to stand firmly against the English system, inshallah, and or governments, and or anyone who opposes what is being taught in these schools. This is a declaration and a warning. Just like the explanatory memorandum was a declaration and a warning. And we would do well to take them at face value because they mean exactly what they say. And so I'm making a declarative statement here on this Zoom webcast that there's going to be more attacks if we don't take this to heart. Even if we take it to heart, we won't necessarily prevent all of them but we can have a significant effect, impact on their goals and intentions. And so we're coming full circle. We're almost done. The government should only ignore but delete the information that officers like myself are putting into the system to help protect our country from terrorism. Globally, they did the same thing. In fact, so badly that an entire half of the half of the structure of the global Al Qaeda movement has been essentially ignored for the last 18 years. Well, that's not the case anymore. That's one thing that happened with Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is kind of a 9/11 type of an event in the sense that it's a wake-up call. It's a very dramatic thing that happened, very traumatic in Sri Lanka. And it's a signal from the global movement that they, they're very serious about what they intend to do. So that's the last slide. And I see that we have uh, a number of questions that are lined up. So I, we're ready to start with the questions here. Philip, let me, let me thank you for that incredible briefing. We've just gotten a briefing, a national security briefing, which most people have never have never seen or heard this material. Uh, Mary, while you're getting the questions ready, I just got one other topic to bring up, Philip, if you would. If you, boy, can you hear me, Philip? Okay. Um, there was an article. I had to look up Sri, Sri Lanka on the map, and I see that it's offshore from the southern tip of India. And there was an article about the state of India, a part of India right, adjacent where they are out, they are creating a watch list to watch a collection of imams from around the world who could infect uh, this part of southern India and bring forward another Sri Lanka inside of the territory of India. It was interesting, Philip, because that article actually listed UK imams, Canadian imams, and a number of US imams who have an impact on the uh, the the Indian subcontinent and that the government there is monitoring. They have a watch list to watch the, the actions of these imams to prevent them from infecting, um, uh, creating jihadis in, in the madrasas and other places within within that territory. I found it interesting that there are U.S. imams that they're watching. The question is, we wonder if anybody is watching those U.S. imams in America. They were. You were, <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> and I mean that literally, those 
Okay. There's several well-known imams that were that I was tracking. We call it tracking. Okay. While I was active duty, because they're connected with this macro branch of Islam. I keep saying the word, but it's the Deobandi branch of Islam. And that are half of the, what we know of as Al Qaeda. And it's like they've been going on back and forth under the radar all this time. No thanks to the Obama administration, who literally destroyed the information. It's like a black hole. You know, we, we talk a lot about the border wall, and we should be. But there, and that there are holes in the border wall, right? There's other kinds of borders. They're allegorical. There's abstract borders within our country that have huge holes in them. And that is where people are allowed to come back and forth into the country who should not be. And that efforts were made years and years ago to track them more carefully, but the federal government came in and destroyed the information. That is like driving a tank right through the walls of a building. And now it's coming out in the year 2019 that the very same individuals are, as you said, on watch lists in the countries where they actually originated from, meaning India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and so on, and that these Deobandi Tablighi Jamaat people and the Tawheed Jamaat people and the ones like the Imams that you're referring to, they recognize them. Just like some of the countries in the Middle East have designated the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization because they know very well who they are, now these governments and intelligence agencies in the Indian subcontinent are doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So there's a joining here, and that's all a good thing. But they should, I, I'm sure they must, I certainly hope they do, just look at the code of conduct. They tell you exactly what they intend to do. And so the best way to prepare for that is to be aware of what they intend to do. And again, you think back. People in Washington, D.C., within the executive branch of the government, sat down at a table and made a deliberate and intentional decision that they were going to destroy this information. For whatever reason, genius reasons that they said they had, well, they actually did it. And now here we are, years and years later, where the like emerging submarine coming up out of the water we're seeing how big object that used to be down below really is. So is there hope? Yes. The level of awareness is increasing. It's about time. It's, it's heartening to me that specialists are beginning to realize that the force of gravity is coming out of the madrasas. Just to be able to identify that is actually a great tactical advantage. It's like having the playbook of the opposite team. But now the question will be whether they have the wherewithal to follow through on it. At the very least, I hope in the days and weeks and months and years ahead that we as Americans do. Because as I showed you in the one slide, those groups are here too. So we're not immune to it. And uh, we can address it. We have the tools to do it. We have personnel that would like to help. It's just a matter of, you know, giving the go-ahead. Well, Philip, before we get into questions uh, from our attendees, I've got a question. As, we, as I was listening to you talk, I was looking through the foreign terrorist uh, list, and they have the AQIS, but they should they have these individual groups also identified? Because I didn't see the Tablighi, Tablighi Jamaat or the Tawheed Jamaat. Should they also be in li uh, on the list separately to AQIS? Well, that's part of the basis of why the uh, 
Obama administration shut down the Tablighi case. They said that they weren't designated terrorists. Mm -hmm. But wait a minute, how in the world can you ever uh, fulfill the criteria for a designation if you're running around deleting and destroying the information as fast as we gather it? Mm. So that's actually an indictment, just like they said that this was some obscure, small, little-known group called Tawhid Jamaat when it's actually part of a coalition of about 15 different branches all over the world, including here, that's not small and obscure. And the state, by the way, Dick, that you talked about in India is called Tamil Nadu. Yeah. Tamil Nadu. And it's the southern state in India. And ethnically, people in Sri Lanka are very, very similar to the people in the southern state of India. And the real core of leadership and influence for Hashim and his group of bombers in Sri Lanka came from the Tawhid Jamaat in Tamil Nadu. Wow. And that individual that I showed you next to Yusuf al Dawi, the eminent Deobandi leader, has yeah. connections to those groups in the country of India. He's from there. And, uh, you know, it's obvious we could talk for days and days about this, and it's hard to cover every, you know, make a precise point. But that's the connection. Tamil Nadu is really where it comes from. And that's 100% Dale Bundy. Wow. Let Mary, me, he's got a lot of questions. Uh, from <laughs> we do. We okay. do. Let me, uh, let me start with one I think uh, is, is an important one to ask. Claire is asking, please ask Phil to discuss Pakistani ISI sponsorship of so many of the Deobandi Islamic terror groups. She's so right. If this was a, if this was a rope with 20 or 30 or 40 threads and one of them was Pakistan, it would be ro woven through the whole rope. It's woven through the fabric of the AQIS the Abundi Coalition because um, a lot of it has to do one of the sore spots is, is Kashmir and that's a disputed territory between Pakistan and India and the, uh, the uh, Pakistani uh, intelligence and military uses these madrasa boys as frontline soldiers for their efforts there fighting India in places like Kashmir. Mm. And we all know that they had a big hand to play in the creation of what we know of as today as Taliban. A Taliban just means student, it's plural of students. So what are they students of? They're students of the Deobandi Madrasas. They're just like those little boys that we saw in the pictures that I showed you that were studying Quran and then at one point they got to the end of their studies and they either went on to become imams like the ones that got kicked out of Sri Lanka or they became specialists in fiqh and studied Sharia or a large portion of them went off to the battlefield all the way as far away as Syria, Iraq they're, they're down in Somalia, I mean they're probably over in Nigeria, they're all over the place and she's right Hockey. And we could do a whole PowerPoint on the <laughs> involvement and influence and role of Pakistan in this whole convoluted kaleidoscopic coalition that we know of as AQIS or the Deobandi movement. Because really, it's all, to simplify it, every one of these groups has exactly the same stated purpose, that the dean of Allah will prevail, Yahatun feel all art, that they will prevail in the world. And we're part of the world. We're not immune to it. Their intention is very, very plain and simple. What's complicated and kaleidoscopic are the texts. But the goal is the same, implementation of the Deen of Allah, meaning Sharia, everywhere in the world. And they feel, through this concept of a strong versus a weak response, that the wind is in their sails right now and they're going to push forward because if not now then when and as i said as we squeeze the balloon in iraq and syria boink out it comes over into the indian subcontinent 
and now it's become, in my opinion, a new center of gravity for the entire global Islamic movement. And they caught us a little bit off guard, because as I said, seven of the original founding members of the coalition we know of as Al-Qaeda are all Deobandis, centered out of the Indian subcontinent. So there's a huge force of gravity there. And now it's been pushed. Now the focus is coming on to that area of the world. And yes, Pakistan is like totally woven in to the fabric of this whole structure. Mm. We've got a couple of questions asking how they can get a hold of the Code of Conduct. Is it available on the Internet? Um, yes, it is available on the Internet. How about if I send it to you? Okay. You have the website, right? Yes. And you can create an access for it so people can come right onto your website yep. and get yep. it. Because it's probably no big shock that it's become suddenly kind of difficult to find. Okay, we'll get it and post it up with this video. Yeah, let's do that because that way it's a safe source. Because as they always do, as soon as the, the lights get turned on, they all scatter. And it, it is, I'm glad I kept it. Good. There is one source that has a live link. You know these days how long those links will stay alive. So right. I'll send it to you and you can just have it secure right there on your website. Perfect. As long as our website website stays up, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> Another subject, right? Yeah, quite a few questions are coming in as far as uh, how many are there in the United States as far as the Army of Darkness? How many madrasas are here? And are we really monitoring the ones here to uh, no, have an impact on us? Sorry to interrupt you, Mary. No, go no, ahead. We were. I caught the first generation going out. Mm -hmm. The first generation of either naturalized or native-born children of immigrants coming here from that part of the world, whose parents then set, turned around and sent them back out to go to the madrasas in South Africa. Why South Africa? Because they teach in English. These kids grew up speaking English as their native language, or their or their close second language. Plus, it's inexpensive. It doesn't cost but about $1,200 a year to send your son to a madrasa, the Zachariah Madrasa, Darulun Madrasa in South Africa. And it's a center node of all the English-speaking countries in the world, meaning uh, New Zealand, Australia, the UK, America, Canada, and so on. The, the headquarters of the Dar Loom Deobandi system is in Dewsbury, UK, not mm -hmm. in India. Why do you suppose it's in Dewsbury? Because the English-speaking world is the last against in this effort. Mm -hmm. And so, no, they're not monitoring them, not anywhere near as they should. We were, but the last year I worked on the case, they got a bright idea, the Madrasa boys. There were about 15 or 20 of them. And they would come back every year for the Ramadan. And they called me the guy with the white hair. And they wanted to avoid talking to me when they came back home through Atlanta. So what they did, they came up with the brilliant idea that they would divert and they would go to other port, like, like New York, Chicago, Detroit. And then they'd catch a domestic flight and come home the rest of the way on a domestic flight. So they wouldn't have to come and see me. But what they did is they revealed that they knew exactly what they were up to. And I actually learned something sadly but significant. That in my own colleagues at the other ports, despite all of the evidence that was there in the system, virtually every single one of them went right through primary, stamped their passports and what we call DTR down the road, which told me that my own colleagues in the agency had less than even basic investigative skills and didn't even take the time to you know they were all subject of active cases so that's one of those holes in the system that I was telling you about and that's because of the corrosive influence from top on down of DHS well executive branch through DHS right down to the deputy field offices to the level that you're not allowed to develop these cases and if you do it 
you could find yourself in professional trouble. So what younger kid, what younger officer is going to take that risk? They're not going to do it. Do you know? Do you have an estimate of how many are here? Oh, how many specific Tabliki Jamaat? Well, you could start with their world headquarters in North America, which is right by LaGuardia. Uh, their mosque complex, like the one in, in uh, Drewsbury, UK, is right next to the LaGuardia airport. And if I was suddenly, once again, active duty, that's what I would do. I would go check it out. I'd find out, uh, you know, how much activity there is there and find out what other branches and affiliated mosques across the country um, you know what they were doing but at the time that I had the case going the Tablighi Jamaat initiative I had 1600 entries individuals and organizations and I the way it was going some every day if I'd actually been still doing it we probably would have been in the three or four or five thousand mm. um, category by now so it's in the thousands for sure is is every madrasa Dale Bondi or no. are they a mixture? They're a mixture of the different no, Islamic sects, is aren't they? Not every madras is a Deobandi. Okay. The ones that are specifically, if, you, if you're really curious, the ones that are actually called Dar al mm -hmm. like the Dar al al-Islamiya in San Bernardino, that's like a trademark. That's like Burger King or McDonald's. You know if it's called Dar al then it's 100% for sure going to be Deobandi. But another name they use quite often is Darul Hikmah. Hikmah. Darul Hikmah means the house of truth. And uh, there was a new baby one, Darul Hikmah, out of Chicago. And another one was called the Institute of Islamic Education. That's how I actually broke the case open originally. Was I found a madrasa in Chicago, and I found a brand new little baby one called Darul Hikmah. It was being set up just in the same template as all the other Darl Hikma madrasas all over the world. So it, they're replicating, just like you know, just like a machine, just stamping them out exactly the same all over the world. So that's what I would do if I was suddenly uh, deputized to be active duty. I'd go right back where I left off before, and I would see where things were now but I know that those in, those organizations still exist because I've even looked on their website quite recently so they're still all there still and active they're, they're creating these kids by the way they don't finish school they take them out of public school they never even get a GED and all their well, around a fourth fifth sixth grade right in that range all the way through till the end of graduation of high school all they study is the Quran and then there's the more public Islamic schools that use textbooks that openly teach jihad and hatred of non-believers and the one particular book is called Quranic Prism and I was working on that case when I got shut down and, and, and uh, sequestered and it had page after page after page of explicit uh, instruction on how these students in these American schools should fight for the cause of Allah and stand up for Sharia law. So it isn't just the Deobandi madrasas. Dick, did you have something you wanted to jump in with? or? Well, yeah, just a, just a comment. You know, we, we know about the British Empire, and we understand that, you know, with all over the Indian subcontinent and all of those people were English subjects. Well, now that you're telling us the story, it just reminds me of the impact of Pakistan inside the UK. So when you look at the UK, and you study 15 years of grooming gangs uh, in the UK, which we can hardly believe it exists. Grooming gangs, of course, where young girls are uh, picked out and, and brought into prostitution in large numbers with gangs of men who have just maybe uh, come up with, uh, let's go do coming out of a mosque. Those are typically Pakistani uh, mosques, Pakistani people. The other comment would be if you made a comment about getting a double passport, getting from the, the subcontinent into the UK, switching over and then getting permission to go from the UK into Canada or America. 
So it seems to me that we've got this, we've got this Pakistani problem that we may not have wor- known before. And the fact that it can come into North America through, can- through the UK uh, is troubling because we also know that uh, Justin Trudeau is thrilled to have anybody and everybody come into Canada, whether they can get legally into America or not. It's just too close for comfort. Well, Canada lets people come in that even we don't. Okay. So what happens is Americans just go over into the, like the reviving Islamic spirit Mm -hmm. meetings that they have every year in Toronto. They let designated terrorists come there and teach, even ones that we don't let in. So Americans go right over. What a wonderful opportunity for intelligence, huh? If we were monitoring correctly, we would learn so much from just watching the movement of these people. But only about 5% of the Canadian border is even secure, anywhere near secure. And there, there is trafficking going on right now. It doesn't get nearly as much attention as the southern border. But there's a significant amount of cross-border trafficking going up on the Canadian border. And plus you have, there might be more Tablikis up in Canada than there are in America. Because when I was working on the initiative, we were in close affiliation with Canadian customs. And we would, every day, we'd have X number of Tablikis that were trying trying to cross the land border, like in Buffalo, or get over in Detroit, and we would refuse entry to them. And then they would go back and they'd drive several hundred miles and they'd try to pop over the border at another port. Mm -hmm. And we'd catch them there. And so it's been going on for quite some time. You know, I don't have a very firm grip on the numbers anymore because I've been out since the end of July of 15. But I do have friends that are active duty. And they tell me all the time that things are probably worse now than they were even when I was there. And I hate to be such a bearer of bad news. But it's the facts. And... Yet on the other hand, I do. I am very confident that if I had the opportunity, I had a right team of my colleagues that are still active duty, that we could turn it around pretty darn fast. In the same way that Trump has turned a lot of other things around pretty darn fast, we could also address that one if I'm just ever given the opportunity to do it. And I say that reluctantly because I'm certainly not anxious to have to go back in But if I could put the right team together and I was given the protective authorization to do it, I would consider it. And I know that we could improve it. Because I know where the holes are. Because I saw them in real life. And uh, we could improve it very quickly. Well, we've got a lot of people asking about how the Muslim Brotherhood, if they were designated a terrorist organization, if that would have any impact on this, or if it change anything, or open up any eyes to bring awareness to all of this? All the above. Can you imagine the uh, consequences plus members of Congress that have been taking money from the Muslim Brotherhood? Just that, just start with that. All the photo ops and all the speaking engagements at these different groups that members of Congress. And you wouldn't see Nihad Awad and Linda Sarsour parading up and down the halls of Congress anymore, as they do now. You wouldn't see them filing lawsuits against law enforcement officers who are trying to do training, what I call saturation or intruding into the law enforcement arena. You wouldn't see them uh, exerting influence like they do in the public arena, trying to shut meetings down and cooperating with groups like SPLC to uh, tar and feather people simply for speaking their mind. You wouldn't have any of that. They probably would institute phase two of the Holy Land trial. It's just That'd be good. But the thing about it is, above all that, is that this is a tactical step that we can take that doesn't involve firing a single shot or dropping a single bomb anywhere. Why don't we start with that? Exactly. Right here in our own front yard and then work our way out from there rather than the way we seem to do it so often, operating tactically in foreign fields and in unfamiliar territory. How about reverse the equation? 
and stand our ground here and start with what is obvious. We've already been proven for more than 10 years that groups like CARE are front groups for Hamas. It's not, we didn't have to go through the agony of discovery. It's already been proven. It hasn't changed a bit since the, the conclusion of the Holy Land trial in November 2008, mm -hmm. which also means that every single elected or appointed official that's ever had anything to do with these groups uh, I don't even know what the word is for it. Are still affiliated and associated with them, even though they were already open, proven in open court. They accepted donations from them as well. Yeah, I don't know what the word for that. What is the word for that? Corruption. <laughs> so, yeah, that would be, it would send a shockwave all around the world, both in terms of uh, adverse, in terms of the Islamic world, but in positive sense, in terms of our allies, who are also trying to stand up and face the malevolent uh, influence of the Muslim Brotherhood all over the world, it would be a, t a twofer. Yeah. It would encourage our allies and set our adversaries back significantly. And without, got... and with any fire sh shots fired or any bombs being dropped. We've got a couple of questions that actually reference the um, jihadi training camps that are around the United States, and the recent one just found in Alabama. So is there any connection between the Deobandi, the madrasa training, and the jihadi camps as part of it? Any linkage? Not that I've seen. Okay. The, the Deobandis are a lot more Salafi, a lot more, let's say, pure in their theology. A lot of these Jamaat al fukra and other training camp type of a lot of some of them not all of them are converts and they have kind of a hybridized version of Islam that's not necessarily even acknowledged among you know Middle Eastern and Asian subcontinent uh, Muslims okay. I mean they don't necessarily accept Louis Farrakhan as as a true representation of Islam. And the Jamaat al Fukra may or may not be the way they actually follow Sharia and, and what their ideology in, is. But from what I've seen, it's a bit of a hodgepodge of arrangement. Yes, I know they've been around a long time, and even when I was active duty, I didn't follow the case thing is I never got a nexus a connection and we're not allowed to just venture off into the woods you know trying to find you have to have some sort of a, mm -hmm. a nexus we call it and fortunately I had established a nexus with the Muslim Brotherhood right at the beginning of my career and also with top leaky and that was more than enough for me to work on mm. the whole time I was active duty so I really never did uh, spend any time at all investigating the Jamaat al fukra type of uh, Islam here in America. Well, there's uh, many folks attending tonight that are wanting to thank you, wanting to uh, recognize you in the service and having a moral backbone and are so blessed that they have heard your presentation and the education that they've received tonight. So they are very thankful. And then one last question, what and how can citizens act to stop this onslaught to our country? Well, this is part of it, isn't it, what we're doing here? Yep. And I would also say that you've heard me say this before, I'm sure, that if you're going to – if you're going to be active in whatever arena, the civil arena, the political arena, or the law enforcement arena, because it'll be one of the three, um, your prerequisite, your fundamental uh, responsibility is to be able to literally cite chapter and verse from the Constitution what the basis of your position is. In other words, if you say, I'm against Sharia, that's a good and noble thing. But do you know why you're against Do you actually understand constitutionally why that's the right thing? Well, it's Article 6, the Supremacy Clause. 
Well, once you know the answer, it seems pretty obvious, but you would be surprised how many of our allies are, are very outspoken of what they're fighting against, but they're not necessarily as capable of explaining what they're fighting for. And so one of my first encouragements is to become fluent in the Constitution. And we have a great lack of that, don't we? We do. Clear up to and including most politicians mm -hmm. who are really just glorified salesmen. They're capable, they're good salesmen. They sell themselves. But they're virtually completely illiterate when it comes to the Constitution. And so this, the platforms and the positions and the policies that they promote are not constitutional. They come from up here and they seem like they think they're good ideas and it's their ideological worldview, but it's not constitutional. Nothing, for example, that Ocasio-Cortez says is constitutional. And she has a perfect right to a freedom of speech. Fine. But don't practice it while you're a sitting member of the House. If you're going to be in the House, then you need to know the Constitution. And whatever bills and whatever positions you take, you should literally be able to point back to the Constitution and say, this is the basis of my position. Well, we should be the same. And we haven't been. And therefore, we're not as capable in the battlefield arena as we need to be. We lose because we're losing on fine points of the definitions of words. Because our adversaries control the definitions but they don't use the, con the Constitution. That's our strong suit. That's what would keep us from being saturated with the toxic water of political correctness. So learn the Constitution. And then whatever arena you happen to operate in, whether it's the social arena, a lot of time the flashpoint for that is going to be immigration. Or it's in the political arena, and a lot of times the flashpoint for that is the Constitution and whether political positions are constitutional sovereignty and how it's defined. Or if you're in the law enforcement arena, whatever arena you're in, you, you have to be able to um, verbalize, you know, stand on the Constitution. By the way, the flashpoint for the law enforcement is the one we've been talking about. Designation of the Muslim Brotherhood and or other more proactive actions against other obvious Sharia supporting Muslim groups. Because again, that's what it's all about. Sovereignty in the Constitution. That's the actual basis for designating Muslim Brotherhood. Is they're undermining the Constitution. That's they right. are by default illegal because they're not advocating for a constitutional republic. They're advocating for ultimate implementation of Sharia law whether they do it nicely with suits and ties or if they come at you with a hammer or a gun or a sword. It's really all the same. So fundamentally the reason why we defend our country, the platform, the foundation, the protective wall that we have is the Constitution. And so we will all be better if we become fluent and then we'll be able to explain our positions. Well, why, Mr. Heaney, do you oppose Sharia law? Shouldn't we all just get along? <laughs> no, because it violates the Constitution. The U.S. Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Is it possible that there might be some points of con Sharia in the Constitution that are compatible? Yeah, maybe. I mean, we all like hummus, right? We all like Coca-Cola. We have some points of contact. But what about all the rest of them that are in violation, not only in federal, but also state and local? And we need to be that capable of explaining our position. So twofold, become an uh, expert in your subject, whatever arena you operate in, and then also be able to support that, your premises, with an explanation from the Constitution. And then, my friends, you will become immovable. Nobody can make you back down. They can scream and yell all they want. But as long as we have a constitutional republic, there's virtually nothing they can do. And that's what they're finding out, isn't it, with President Trump? Yeah. They're, they're in the state of furious hysteria, but they're fighting against the Constitution, and he knows it. That's right. He has an intuitive understanding of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. 
and that's what he's really defending. And uh, as it's defined by the Constitution in the checks and balances form of government. So it's a civics lesson. That's where we're at right now. It's even more fundamental than fighting against terrorism. It's standing up for our sovereignty as defined by the Constitution. That is if we want to remain one. Because we're not, as so often you hear, a democracy. We're a constitutional republic. And there's a big difference between them. Well, I'll turn it back over to you, Dick, to uh, close us out. And uh, just say a special thank you to Philip for joining us tonight from me. And I know you're going to do the same. But uh, we're just really, so much information that you have shared with us tonight is uh, just essential to know. And I so thank you for being with us. Well, you're welcome. And certainly you're welcome to put the uh, PowerPoint up. And okay. I'll give that uh, code of conduct to you. Okay. So that the people that are listening can um, have access to it. Yep. And I will be there. I'll be getting the uh, recording put up in the next day or so, depending on whatever else I have to get done, but I will make this a priority. So um, look for it very soon on the United West uh, Sharia Crime Stoppers page. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Philip, you've, bl you've blessed us this evening. As Mary has said, Mary, thank you for hosting the question so well. And Philip, of course, for providing the information to answer them. Uh, those of you that, uh, have absorbed, I think, a very special briefing this evening. It's a national security briefing. You probably have not heard anything like that other places. And, and we're really grateful that we could be bring Philip to you. Hang on to that. We've got just a couple of slides and we'll get some other good news coming coming up here. Uh, before I do that, let me mention, I think it's important to designate the Muslim Brotherhood of Terrorist Organization. But I would recommend that one of the action items we should pursue is to have Philip Haney designated as a uh, expert that needs to be brought into the administration. Amen. So sit down with the president of the United States and let's fix this problem. Um, all right, so we're gonna continue. We're very fortunate to have national security experts to continue to do, be part of our Tuesday night en enemies, within, enemies Within webinars. And so we have another Tuesday, that would be the 21st. And we have Claire Lopez, who's gonna be joining us talking about the country of Turkey. I think Philip shined a big spotlight on Pakistan tonight. Uh, we, we certainly hear about uh, Saudi Arabia and so on, but what about Turkey? And so Claire's going to be with us next Tuesday night to talk about Turkey as a NATO ally or a Muslim Brotherhood enemy with So We look forward to seeing Claire Lopez next week. Uh, some more good news. Well, there's Claire and the other guy. That, of course, would be the Erdogan who runs Turkey, and uh, Claire will be providing uh, in-depth information into his background, his objectives, and the problems that he's bringing to America through his association with the Muslim Brotherhood. We move to the 28th, and wow, look, it's Philip Haney back again. And the reason for that is that Philip Haney will be in Israel, traveling uh, with Tom Trento and uh, other folks who will be also in in Israel uh, on that trip. Uh, Mary, you could fill me in on these, some of the other people. I believe Claire will be there and some other national security experts. Yes. Uh, I don't know if we want to give out the list, but yes, there's going to be okay. a whole host of national security folks on this tour of Israel. So, so thank you, Tom Trento. Philip will be providing us an update just two weeks from tonight. The reason being, again, this is Ramadan. A lot happens in May. It's also Israel Independence uh, Day is celebrated. There's also some speculation about some kind of a deal that might uh, be worked out with Jordan, etc. So, uh, Philip, of course, understands Dio Bondi, but so much more. So we're going to get an update from Philip uh, on the ground in Israel in just two weeks. Um, we always close with some action items. Again, we've repeated this, but we really, you are one team. You are part of the team. Spread the word. We're in World War III. It is the red, green axis. It's the followers of Marx and the followers of Mohammed that have formed the axis to take down America. We need you to be out there. It, it's... We do, do not hesitate to remind you repeatedly that if Trudeau wins in Canada and Trump loses in America in 2020, uh, free people like us who might call ourselves the people of God will be uh, in trouble. And finally, we always try to stress polarization. That is, what can you say specifically when you see evil? How can you compare it? How can you 
confront evil directly without mincing words. Tonight, our phrase is the mafia. We're purposely using the word mafia because people understand that it is, as Philip has explained, a vast international crime syndicate. The crime we've been talking about tonight is mass murder, uh, San Bernardino to Sri Lanka, and it's got to be defeated. It's got to be defeated as, as we went after the mafia. Uh, so that's really uh, how important this is. We are Sharia Crime Stoppers. We appreciate your attendance and please spread the word. We are part of the United West. The United West gives us this platform, enables us to continue to do this. We're committed every Tuesday for the webinar, every Friday for the radio program. And on the United West, you can find Sharia Crime Stoppers to find out how to connect with us um, ongoing on the Friday night or the Tuesday night. And of course, if you feel so motivated, please remember the United West in terms of donation. That's why we continue to do what we do. With that, we'll say good night. We'll thank Philip again and Mary, and we'll look forward to seeing Claire Lopez next Tuesday night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone.